Um, all right, so preemptive apologies. I am insanely passionate about what I'm gonna talk about. And I really want time to talk about this as a group, so I'm gonna talk really fast. Um, <clears throat> I don't post anything online except the things I want my mom to see. So um, I'll give all my stuff to Ryan and he'll post them on his blog. Um, <clears throat> all right, so a couple things that uh, inform where I'm coming from. Uh, the title of my talk is The Great Lie of God's Love. Is God's love actually enough? A couple recommended resources. This is what's informed my topic today on a national perspective, and I'm going to bring my local perspective to this conversation. Um, Sticky Faith, Almost Christian, and Next Christians um, are three books I would recommend. All right, uh, two years ago, I'm standing in the back of our youth room, and we're about uh, 17 or 18 times through the chorus of How He Loves, and <laughs> I'm looking, at my, I'm looking at my kids who are weeping, who have arms around each other, and are clearly having a very emotional and relational response to worship. There's definitely something happening in this room that doesn't happen outside of this room. And for a lot of years, I've, this has been fantastic. I've, I've loved these moments, but uh, the problem was that the Holy Spirit was there, and that's a problem because it changed my perspective of what I was seeing. The problem of what I was seeing was that I was seeing worship absent of transformation. See, our worship should lead to transformation because transformation leads to worship. It's a cyclical cycle, and so if you take out transformation as an equation of worship, then you're just worshiping for worship's sake, which is very self-satisfying. And so now we're just singing songs and feeling good. We might as well be a, at a One Direction concert, because um, that would be a whole lot more fun, and I wouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> And so I'm seeing worship without transformation. And so now this is a problem because I left the room with this question. Is God's love actually enough anymore? See, my whole life, I, I was born in 1983, so I got the kind of end of the boomers and their very beginning of the millennials. So um, I got the, like, I'm the perfect blend. I'm uh, what Ben wishes he could be, and, <clears throat> and, and so I grew up with this high, um, high truth, high um, uh, justification, but also this very real understanding of brokenness, and I grew up believing that if we can just get people to understand that God loves them, really understand that, then it changes everything. If that could be the only thing people hear from me is that God loves you, then that is enough. But all of a sudden, I started questioning that. Because here's the great lie of God's love for youth today. They believe that God loves me unconditionally just as I am, accepting and affirming all that I am, do, and desire. See, this is the great lie of God's love because it's half true. It's a half truth. It looks great, it sounds great, and it feels excellent. God's love is un God loves me unconditionally just as I am. The whole Bible affirms this. No prerequisites required for God's love. But the problem is the accepting and affirming of all that I am, do, and desire. This is the great lie of God's love, and I believe that this is the lie, this is the love that our youth today are believing in, are following, and are proclaiming. And I wish it was way more heretical than this, like way more blatantly, because then we could call it out and recognize it very easily. But just like in Eden, did God really say? Just like in the desert, it's these half-truths that are the hardest to recognize and are the hardest to combat. So how do we get here? Love, 
uh, I believe that youth today have a different understanding of what love is than the love that we're trying to proclaim. See, love for the, our teenagers today means it doesn't require change. If you love me, you take me for exactly how I am. Love is tolerant and inclusive, affirming of every thought, deed, and action. See, in the Bay Area, tolerance and acceptance are the highest moral ground. If I can get to a place where I am tolerant and accepting of everybody, I've achieved the highest moral standard. And that's what love is. Love always feels good and it does not hate. See, asking someone to change means is the exact same as I hate you or I hate a part of you. And so change and love do not fit in the same definition. So how did we get to a place where our teenagers have this perspective of love? I love how Ben set a good stage for the boomers and the millennials. I'm going to carry that forward. See, with the boomers, there was this unprecedented church growth. The church blew up in huge ways. But it was built around um, building churches around like-minded people groups with similar needs and wants. If we can get people who look like each other, want the same things, have the same needs and desires, and meet those specifically, then we're going to be able to grow this thing exponentially. And it worked. But the problem is, it created very clear boundaries of who's in and who's out. And that also comes from a great benefit of the boomers, is holding a high value on truth. Scripture memorization. I was a children of Awana. I got all my Sparky Awards in the Iwana Olympics because I memorized all these verses for like three minutes to get my jewels and my crown. <laughs> high value on truth in scripture led to high value on personal righteousness and right living. These are great things that the boomers brought and held and esteemed, but there were some very clear downsides to that. Then you have the late Gen X, early millennials who the pendulum swings the opposite direction, where the boomers had the, were responsible and accounted for this great church growth. The Gen Xers and now millennials are responsible for this church deconstruction. We've seen what these hard and fast boundaries of the church have the impact of that. And so now what we want to do is we want to blur these lines. We want to question who's really in and who's really out. And we're going to be high grace. We're going to be high grace because we haven't seen that from this righteous... Um, construction of holiness, of where being, being a good person is more important than becoming the person that God desires. And so that's where the millennials are high grace, the Gen Xers are high grace, and there's this deconstruction, and we need that high grace, but the downside of this aspect is that it's created an ambiguous identity of the church, and it's created an ambiguous identity of God. Because any spiritual experience, encounter, or thought is now welcome because there are no clear boundaries. Today's teenagers live in this tension where most often they, they feel that they have to choose between being a Christian of truth or being a Christian of grace. They look at their parents or maybe their grandparents and see that boomers have this high value of truth. This is what Jesus says. This is the answer to all the questions. But then they look at their youth pastors and the young leaders of the church who are saying all are welcome in the grace of God's love. It's a process. We, want, we don't want to tell you what you can't be because that's Jesus' job, not mine. And see, so they hear Jesus in the church and they see Jesus outside of the church. Because culturally, we're high grace, particularly here in the Bay Area. Who am I to judge you? And so now our teenagers live in this tension between, do I choose truth or do I choose grace? When in actuality, they want both, they desperately want both. 
They want to know the answers. They live in an information age where they can get answers to all their questions in as, as fast as you can retweet anything. But they also want to see grace because they're so hyper-connected to everybody that they instantly feel the effects of rejection. And so our teenagers desire to be in a place where they see truth and grace living together, but because boomers and Gen Xers have all this angst together, <laughs> and the pendulums have swung so far apart from each other, that what our teenagers today have constructed is poor truth and weak grace. And that's how they're moving forward in their discipleship and their following of Jesus. So what is our response? I believe that teenagers will learn to live in grace and truth most effectively through intergenerational relationships that regularly practice personal and communal, communal confession and repentance as a primary spiritual discipline. Confession, as a repen confession and repentance communally in intergenerational relationships. I believe this is the opportunity that we have to help right our past wrongs and create a better future, a fuller truth of God's love for our teenagers today, while being also the beneficiaries of what we're practicing and teaching. Okay, so of all this, of all the problems, of all the ways we can teach God's love, the truth of God's love, why confession and repentance? Because I believe that it brings the best aspects of all generations to the table, and it manifests them. See, when we confess, it's a recognition of our submission in sinful nature in light of God's holiness. This is where the boomers knocked it out of the park. Their understanding that I'm broken, those four spiritual laws are fantastic. They're biblical truth. We can't refute them. And so we can't swing so far away from that. And so we need the boomers. We need that high value of truth at the table saying, I know everybody's welcome here, but there is something greater that we all need to submit to. There's a standard of holiness that we don't match up to. Regardless of where we're coming from, we need that truth. But also we need at that table and in this relationship of confession, we need grace. We need people who are unconditionally ready and willing to give you grace and give you a second chance. And that's where the Gen X, and particularly the millennials, excel at. They're ready to give more second chances than we've ever experienced before. But without the truth, it's just weak grace. Thank you, Bonhoeffer. And so we need both voices at the table because one without the other is a half-truth. And confession is innately humbling <clears throat> and disarming for all those involved. I can't be prideful and pious and be sincerely confessional at the same time. I can't point fingers at what's wrong with you while I'm confessing what's wrong with me. And so when we bring people to the table around confession, it creates a level playing field. It gets us all on the same page. <clears throat> it brings the best of all generations together. So why repentance? Because then, once we're on the same page, it allows all three generations to walk forward together. It allows us all to walk forward without pointing fingers, but holding hands and saying, what does the fullness of God look like contextually for our communities and contextually in my own life? Because we've all confessed that we don't get it and we've learned from each other, we've experienced grace from each other. Okay, great. Now let's move forward together in truth and grace. I would say that in confession as a youth pastor when I, th I was thinking about, man, I would never want my 14-year-old freshman boy to be in a confessional room <laughs> with my like 55-year-old ex-marine drug addict volunteer. Like the things that they're going to be confessing are completely different. That's like inappropriate, reckless discipleship. 
So my suggestion would be around confession, we begin with how have we been loving our neighbor? How have I loved my neighbor? Because it brings into that question of love. How have we been loving our neighbor? If we can confess the ways together that we have not been loving well, then we get to collectively submit to the definitions that Jesus lives and provides for us in Scripture while bringing what we all know and believe and have experienced from our own context that God has gifted generations to excel at. And so why intergenerationally? Why can't we just get teenagers around in a room together confessing and repenting together? They get each other. They get what's going on. Why can't we get adults just to confess all the things that we all know that they have to repent of? Because all are gifted and all have a place in this process. Acts 2.17 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your younger will see visions. Your elder will dream dreams. We have teenagers who have felt callings and want to go in significant directions of life. I mean, that's been affirmed in all our speakers so far and our presenters that they want to make a difference. They have a vision of what is possible, but they need the dreams of the elders of, man, this is what it could look like. And what if we got this? And what if this happened? I remember in my day, the mistakes that I made and how that, where that's brought us. And if you could live this way, and if we could live this way together, how much fuller would your vision for your future be? We need those conversations together. God will pour out his spirit on all people. And so when we have the generations together in confession and repentance, we see a manifestation of God's love that's unprecedented. And so that's what I got. Um, I'm still working it out. I can't say that this is a silver bullet by any means. Um, but this is what I'm trying to do in my context. So I'd love to hear your questions. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, my first, que- or my first question would be like, how, how, would you, how, would you, how would your kids describe God's love for them?